Pastor Randy had mentioned to me that you guys are beginning a sermon series in the book of 1 John. And he asked me to do the next portion of that series. And I've entitled my message this morning, Walking in the Light. Now, typically when I preach, I like to read the entire passage and then go back and look at it in a little bit more detail, okay? And so uh, we're going to be reading 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. <clears throat> I'm reading from the New International Version. You can follow along on the screen if you'd like to. The Apostle John is writing, this is the message we have heard from him and declared to you. God is light. In him, there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, <clears throat> we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in our lives. Now there's a lot going on here. I mean, there could easily be like two months worth of sermons just in those few short verses right there if you really wanted to dig into the meat and potatoes. But we're just going to be taking a brief look at, uh, at some of the main points here. And as I look at this section of Scripture, I see two main sections. Section 1 is verses 5 to 7, and section 2 is verses 8 to 10. And so we're going to jump right in to the first section with 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 which says, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him, there is no darkness at all. So we're told that God is light. What does that mean, that God is light? Well, let's think about it for a moment. What is the purpose of light? What does light do? Well, one of the things that light does is it causes things to grow. We all know that plants need sunlight, right? You know, the whole photosynthesis and all that kind of stuff. And without light, plants will die. Without plants, the food that I really like will die. <laughs> okay? You know, um, you know the, the animals that eat plants, they will die. Life on earth would not exist as we know it without light. It causes things to grow. So as I look at this aspect of light, I can definitely see a correlation with God. God's light will cause us to grow if we are willing to grow. God's light will cause us to grow if we are willing to to grow. Now, if I were to ask for a show of hands, how many of you here are willing to grow? Most of you would probably raise your hand, I would assume. But yet, I also know that there are many, many, many areas in all of our lives where we don't want to grow. Why do I say that? Because to be able to grow, to be able to learn, to be able to mature, I have to be willing to admit that I don't have all knowledge that there is to have on any given topic. I have to be willing to admit that I might be wrong. Now, I know it will come to a surprise to many of you, but occasionally, I am wrong, okay? Obviously, I'm being facetious there, but yet we all act that way at times. Don't believe me? Meet me afterwards. Let's get in a, t a, a talk about politics. Oh, I promise you, there are areas where I am not willing to grow and there's areas where you are not willing to grow. Promise. To be able to grow, I have to be willing to admit that I might be wrong, that I don't possess all knowledge. In fact, any area in which I am unwilling to admit the possibility that I may be wrong is an area that it is impossible for me to grow. And here's the other thing about growth. It comes in stages. Growth comes in stages. When we are young, we believe things that we discover really aren't true. 
Like in grade school, they oversimplify a lot of, like history especially gets oversimplified. Some things that are still taught that are flat out wrong, like, you know, Columbus proved that the earth is round. No, he didn't. They knew, society knew that the earth was round before Jesus was born. Mathematicians in Greece proved that. Okay, all educated people knew that the world was round when Jesus walked the earth. Columbus didn't do that. But yet, I bet if I were to go into most any elementary school, you know, who proved that the world was round? Columbus. No, that's not it. Oh, we believed it, but it's not true. You ever notice how a lot of times the things that you learned in, in grade school, when you got to high school, you kind of had to relearn because you found out that not all of that was true. And then the, those went on to higher education, you get to college, and you find out in some of your college classes that the things you learned in high school really weren't all that accurate. Yeah. As we mature, we're able to handle more information and get a more complete picture. If I have a five-year-old come up to me and say, why is the sky blue? I'm not going to go into, you know, the light and prisms and, you know, I'm not going to, well, first of all, I couldn't because I don't understand it that well. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm not going to give a purely scientific answer. No, I'm not going to do that. In fact, for a five-year-old, I might say, because it's not green, have a nice day, you know. I don't know, but I mean, we're not going to give them the scientific explanation. If a three-year-old asks where babies come from, please don't tell them. You'll freak them out, <laughs> okay? You know, give them an age-appropriate explanation. I'm not saying lie to them, but give them an age-appropriate explanation. That's fine, but you don't give them all the details. You wait till they're older, till they're more mature, till they're able to handle it. Our spiritual growth is the same thing. When I first came to know Jesus 40 years ago, be 40 years ago last month, next month, 40 years ago next month, February, that I received Christ. When I first started following Jesus 40 years ago, there were things that I held on to very strongly that I definitely don't now. Why? Because I know more. I've, I've matured. I've grown. I understand more. You, you follow what I'm saying? You know, I, I got saved in a fundamentalist Baptist church. You didn't play cards. Cards were evil. That could lead you down a path. And I, I believed that for a while. Oh, no, if I'm a follower of Jesus, I can't play cards. Well, then it kind of gradually grew into, like, you know, Uno's okay. Yeah, Uno's all right. And, and then it got to, like, well, I can, I can play other things as long as I'm not gambling. Okay. Well, then I realized, you know, gambling's not really a sin. I mean, it's not real smart, <laughs> but it's not a sin. You know, I, I, as I grew and as I mature, things change. This is a process that should continue for the rest of our lives. But I've discovered that a huge percentage of the population has no desire to put in the work necessary to learn and mature. We've become a society that wants to think in quick, simple sound bites. But the problem is, quick, simple sound bites don't always cut it. Like, how many of you, like, I mean, I, you know, when TikTok first came out, you were, it was very brief. And now you can go for like three or four minutes. And how many of you are watching some of those three or four minute TikToks? You're like, all right, are we done yet? You know, I don't want to spend three minutes. That's forever. You know what I mean? We want the quick, easy sound bites. I heard a quote a couple of years ago that rang true, and the quote said this, most people prefer a simple lie over a complex truth. Most people prefer a simple lie over a complex truth. And when you combine that with things like cognitive biases, cultural and, and family traditions, tribalism, and you know, spiritual growth is not nearly as easy as you think it is. I remember a conversation I had a few years ago with a guy, and the, the topic wasn't relevant, but he was just flat out wrong. And he said, but that's what my mom always taught me. And the only thing that came to mind, I didn't say this, but the only thing that came to my mind was that scene from The Water Boy when Colonel Sanders says, Mama's wrong. 
because he was the kind of guy that might have done the, you know. <laughs> but uh, anyway, <laughs> you know, we get all these things like we've always believed this. It's hard to get out of those beliefs. And I could continue on this for a long time, but let's just leave it here. We need to be willing to grow if growth is going to happen. Here's the other thing about light. Light keeps us healthy. Light gives us vitamin D. Vitamin D affects our mood. I suffer from seasonal affective disorder. When you don't get enough sunlight, when the vitamin D does not get into your skin, it brings about a depression. Typically, somewhere around the first to the middle of February, I really struggle. Why? Because I, I don't get outside a lot. All right? Don't get a lot of sunlight. And I know I'm not alone. I know many of you suffer with that as well. But vitamin D helps our moods. It does other things for us nutritionally. It's essential to a healthy, healthy life. Now think about this. Basking in the light of God... Oh, man, that does amazing things. Have you ever just been still in the presence of God? In fact, I heard somebody talk about that this morning. Be still and know that I am God. We struggle with that. I encourage you, take some time. Total silence, no music, no phone. Just sit there and focus on God. Say, here I am, Lord. Speak. Empty your mind. Now, I do that frequently. Sometimes God speaks to me. Sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes his voice sounds an awful lot like my own. But I tell you, basking in God's presence, that's oh, just awesome. Sometimes doing it corporately is, is amazing. Uh, back in the, the late 90s, there was a revival going on in Toronto and uh, I had the opportunity at the time I was working at Corning and I needed to get some training and the training classes, they, they had the class I needed either in Baltimore or in Toronto. Now my boss was a Christian. We went to church together. We'd gone to Toronto together to experience the revival that was going on up there. And he came to me, he was like, all right, we need to send you some training. He said, and you can either go to Baltimore. I'm like, that's cool. I've been to Baltimore's all right. He said, or you can go to Toronto and take classes during the day and go to church at night. What do you think? I said, dude, I don't even have to think. Let's go to Toronto. So on Corning's dime, I got to go to church. It was great. <laughs> you know, I got there. My son at the time was about three weeks old. Many of you know my son, Josiah. So I get to the hotel again. This is, this is late nineties. So uh, my cell phone didn't work in Canada. Get to the hotel, call my house to say, hey, I've arrived. And my mother-in-law answers and says, Josiah is in the hospital. I said, all right, I'm on my way. She's like, no, 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 call Brenda first. We'd come down with a fever. Being so young, she took him to the doctor. The doctor said, well, because he's so young, we probably ought to put him in the hospital for a couple of days. And uh, so my wife was at the hospital. She's like, there's nothing you can do. Stay there. You'll be all right. And I'm like, yeah, I'll be all right. I was a mess absolute mess. Got settled in my hotel room. Couldn't even really eat. And you know, for me, that means something's wrong. <laughs> you know, I went to church that night and it was the week after they had this major conference and it was just a small group of people. When I walk in, my two favorite worship leaders of all time were there, Jeremy Sinant and Ruth Fazal. You may not have ever heard of them, but I tell you, people who can bring you right into the throne room. It was oh, fantastic. And we had a time of prayer, and we're just all like, you know, laying out on the carpet. And Jeremy plays guitar phenomenally, and he's just walking around playing guitar and singing, and Ruth plays violin. And she's walking alongside him just playing violin. And I can tell you, I have never felt the presence of God like that, just laying there basking in his presence. And it really helped calm me down and know that my son is going to be okay. It was exactly what I needed. I still look back on that and I'm like, man, Lord, I'd love to experience something just like that again. You know, just basking in his presence. Here's the other thing about light. 
Light allows us to see, right? Without light, we're not able to see. Now, it's certainly possible to live a good life without being able to see. Many people do that. But not being able to see does prevent you from fully experiencing and enjoying the world around you. God's light can allow us to to see and experience things that we could never see and experience if we didn't have it. God's light can remove fear. You ever had light remove fear? You know, like you see that shadow in the corner of your room and you wonder what it is and you flip on the light and oh yeah, it's just the way I laid my pants over the chair. Okay? God's light can help us in so many ways. And and when I think about light, there's another passage of scripture that comes to mind and it's in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 19 to 21. It says, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. Darkness can hide a lot. There's a reason why a lot of crimes happen after dark. And the light of God can reveal everything that the darkness has hidden. Along those lines, let's move ahead to verse 6. Verse 6 of 1 John chapter 1. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. And to understand, again, what these verses are, are saying, we need to define what it means to walk in the darkness and to walk in the light. And first of all, darkness is simply the absence of light. Darkness in and of itself is not a thing. It's just the absence of light. You can only get so dark. There's a limit on how dark things can get. Science has yet to prove a limit on how bright things can be. We're not aware that there's an upper limit of light. Okay? So darkness is just the absence of light. So since darkness is, more than, is nothing more than the absence of light, walking in darkness would basically be the opposite of walking in the light. So then what is walking in the light? Well, if you read scriptures, all throughout scriptures, we see that the symbolism of light and dark is typically used to describe the difference between believers and non-believers, those who are following God and those who are not. Those who are true believers, those who are following God are said to be in the light. Those who aren't are said to be in the darkness. So walking in the light means walking as a true believer or a true follower of God. But again, we have to ask the question, what exactly does that mean? What does it mean to be a true follower of Jesus? Because I bet probably all of us in this room would say that we are. But are we? What does that mean? What's the metric? As I look at the evangelical church in the United States as a whole, I'm not talking about individual churches. I'm talking about as a whole. The evangelical church is doing a horrible job walking in the light horrible job. Any of you that are familiar with the Church 2 movement know exactly what I'm talking about. Over the last couple of years, there have been a lot of scandals of people who have experienced sexual abuse from church leaders. And the churches, rather than dealing with it, covered it up. Shamed the victims. Sometimes kicked the victims out, sometimes sued the victims for defamation, the exact opposite of what Christ would want someone to do. The evangelical church as a whole, again, I'm not talking about individual churches, but as a whole, one of the large messages that we get is if you're not a Republican and a conservative, you're not born again. I had a lady years ago when I was pastoring at Harvest that wanted to follow Jesus but didn't think she could. And I said, why? She said, well, I'm a Democrat. 
can't follow Jesus if I'm a Democrat. You know, and I'm, I know, personally know, an awful lot of Jesus-loving people that would say, that's right. Well, guess what? Jesus wasn't a Democrat, wasn't a Republican. Jesus wasn't even American. Jesus was not a conservative. Jesus was not a liberal. Jesus was not a capitalist. Jesus was not, was not a socialist or any other ist. It, it's irrelevant. It doesn't matter. But yet, that's what I see many evangelical churches pushing. When I look into the mirror, I can honestly say there are days where I'm doing pretty good at walking in the light. I've got some good days. But if I were to be honest, there's also a lot of days when I'm doing a lousy job. I've got a PhD in screwing up. Almost said mess, but you guys know me. Screwing up is more, it's a stronger, more accurate way, okay? I have a PhD in that. Oh, man, can I mess up? Nobody can flub their dub like I can. I have an enormous capacity for self-destruction. Jesus made it quite clear when he said that all the law and the prophets, meaning all of Scripture, can be summed up in two commands. Anybody remember what they are? What's the first one? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. In other words, with every fiber of your being, love God. The second one, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Which brings up another topic for another sermon at another time. If you don't love yourself, you really can't love your neighbor. So you need to learn how to accurately love yourself for you to be able to fulfill the command of God and love your neighbor. It's easy for me to love you. Really hard for me to love myself. Really hard. Jesus said, love God with everything you got. Love your neighbor as yourself. And if you look at the teachings of Jesus in the Gospels, he does a pretty good job of explaining what this looks like. You ever notice the only people that Jesus condemns, the only people that Jesus really comes down hard on are the religious leaders. Why? Because they weren't living what they were teaching. They weren't concerned about people. They were concerned about following a list of rules. In Matthew 23, he condemns the religious leaders for not practicing what they teach and for following the rules without any love, grace, or mercy. When the woman caught in adultery was brought before Jesus, he refused to condemn her, but had no issue telling the religious leaders that they could proceed with the stoning as the law commanded. They were correct when they said that adulterers should be stoned. That's exactly what the law said. And, and by stone, let me just clarify, that means throwing rocks at them until they die. That's what I mean. Okay? That's what the law said. G- they were correct. And Jesus said, yeah, you can do that, but I want the one that doesn't have any sin to throw the first stone. Interestingly enough, there was one person there that didn't have any sin. Jesus. He could have thrown that stone. He had every right. I can show you chapter and verse where it says that he had right. But he didn't. It tells us that the religious leaders, starting with the oldest, started to walk away. And eventually Jesus looked at her and he said, where are your accusers? Now, he also didn't say, I get it, you're lonely, and this happens, and it's, it's okay. No, he didn't do any, he didn't coddle her. He didn't tell her that it was all okay. What did he say? Go and sin no more. I'm not going to accuse you. I'm not going to condemn you. I'm not going to judge you. You know better. Just don't do it again. That's Jesus. Yet I know churches that would drag people like that in front of the entire congregation That's not Jesus. That's not. In fact, Luke 6 tells us we are not to judge or condemn other people, period. We are not to judge or condemn. 
period. Jesus told us in Matthew 25 that we should feed the hungry, give the thirsty something to drink, take care of the stranger and the foreigner. Don't let them drown in a river. You're supposed to take care of them. Clothe the naked, take care of the sick, and visit the prisoner. Matthew 5, in his famous Sermon on the Mount, Jesus tells us not to respond with violence. He tells us to give to anyone who asks and to literally go the extra mile. Now, these are just a few examples, but I think you get what I'm telling you. Let me ask you, how are we doing with that? Now, again, I'm not talking about this church. Overall, I think you guys do a pretty decent job. Like, if you know of somebody that has a need, you're there to help. Now, of course, we can all improve. I get that. You know, we can always do a little bit better. We can all, you know, I'm not saying, I'm not saying you're perfect. Sorry, man. Sorry, Kate. It's just, you know, you're, as awesome as you are, you're not perfect. I've been talking with your wife. She's told me. Yeah, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, but man, as a whole, the evangelical church is not doing good. If you were to stop the average non-believer on the street and ask them what they think of when they think of the evangelical church, their response is probably not going to be, oh man, those people really know how to love and if you have a need, they're the first people that are right there and they're, they're always willing to lend a hand and, and man, you know, they, they help me with this and with that and the other thing and, and yeah, I don't always get some of their beliefs, but man, do those people know how to love. Probably not what you're going to hear. So what I hear, judgmental, homophobic, anti-immigrant, hypocritical, and another long, you know, add more, very negative things. It's not positive. And guess what? It's our fault. Because we haven't been living what Jesus has told us to live. So I want to give you a challenge Here's the challenge. I want you for the next two to three months to read only the Gospels in Scripture. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You can read the Gospels in less than 30 days if you read three chapters a day. So for the next three months, take the time and read the Gospels through three times. Now, I, I do a lot of reading. I can do the two to three chapters in probably about 10 to 15 minutes. Some of you might read a little slower. But in less than half an hour a day, you can read two to three chapters of the Gospels. And while you're doing this, I want you to focus specifically on what Jesus is teaching. Because after all, we're Christians. And what does Christian mean? Christian means little Christ. In other words, somebody who's supposed to be acting just like Jesus. Because, you know, I could stand up here and tell you all the things you need to do. That's just my opinion. You don't need to listen to me. I want you to prayerfully go to the Gospels and say, and before you do, even genuinely ask God, show me what I need to see right now. If there's anything I need to see in what I'm about to read, if there's anything I need to change or add or modify or do differently, let me know. You, know, you cannot listen to me and who cares? You don't listen to God, well, that's, it's going to be some issues, <laughs> okay? Go to God and ask that. I encourage you to do that because we live in a world that is quite literally going to hell in a handbasket and the devil's laughing all the way. We will not bring in the kingdom of God through politics. We won't. My hope does not lie in Washington, D.C. or in Harrisburg. If your hope lies there, I feel sorry for you. My hope is in Jesus and him alone. The only way this society is truly going to change is by changing people's hearts one at a time. Yeah, I can legislate morality, but I can't legislate heart change. What do I mean by that? 
well, I can pass a law that forces you to do things a certain way. Example, I promise you, the only reason why I don't go 100 miles an hour out on the highway is because there's a law against it. If there was no law, I'd be going as fast as my little 2013 Toyota Corolla would take me. Why? Because I love driving fast. <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> but I don't do that because it's illegal and I'd get a ticket and might get my license taken from me and might get my butt kicked by my wife and, uh, you know. I've never gotten a speeding ticket. I did get a warning once, though, and when I showed it to her, she hung it on the bathroom mirror and left it there for a week <laughs> to remind me, you need to slow down. Uh, so, I mean, I can, I can legislate behavior. I will never legislate heart change. And at the risk of sounding like a heretic, I'm going to say that I believe God is more concerned about where your heart is than what your behavior is. Both are important, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying behavior doesn't count, because it does. But I truly believe that God is more concerned about where your heart is. And the only way we're going to change hearts is by loving them into the kingdom. You will never hate somebody into the kingdom of God. You will never judge somebody into the kingdom of God. You will never condemn somebody into the kingdom of God. That doesn't work. You can certainly love them. So for me, walking in the light means living my life in such a way that people will want to fall in love with Jesus. I want to live my life in a way where when people look at me, they're like, man, I don't know what, the, what it is about you, but I got to have it. I got to have it. This is a perfect segue into the second section of our passage today. And I say that because I most definitely want to walk in the light. My desire is to live my life the way that God wants me to live my life. That's what I want to do. But I fall so short sometimes. I feel like the Apostle Paul in Romans. He says, the things I want to do, I don't do. And the things I don't do, or, yeah, the things I want to do, I don't do. And the things I don't want to do, I do. In these moments, it's very easy to allow the lies of the enemy to creep in. And you know what the lies are. You hear them yourself. How could God ever love you? Look what you just did. God could never forgive you for that. You call yourself a Christian and you did that. You're pathetic. How could God ever love you or forgive you? I know those lies fly through my head often. It's very easy to believe those lies and think that since I've messed up so bad and so frequently that there's no hope and I might just as well give up. And in light of that, I want to take a look at verses 8 through 10. Verses 8 through 10 said, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in our lives. So as we dig into those verses deeper, I want to take a look at them a little bit out of order, okay? Because if you noticed, verse 8 and verse 10 really kind of talk about the same thing while verse 9 is slightly different. So verse 9 is one that should be familiar to many of you. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. And I don't know about you, but I find this verse incredibly comforting. Yeah, I mess up a lot. I've never been the Christian that I ought to be. Yes, I've grown over the years. I can honestly say that I am far closer to God now than I ever was 40 years ago. Okay? Do I have a lot that needs to change? Oh, absolutely. There's a lot of growth left. But there's a lot of growth that's happened. I'm not the follower of Christ I ought to be, but thank God I'm not the follower of Christ I used to be. Okay? 
But the good news is that if I confess my sins, they will be forgiven. I'm going to say that again. If I confess my sins, they will be forgiven. Period. End of story. Do you mean any sin? Yes, any sin. You cannot out sin the grace of God. You're not that good. <laughs> you cannot out sin the grace of God. If you truly repent, you will be forgiven of anything that you have done. There's nothing you can do that God will not forgive if you confess, if you repent. I don't care what you've done. God will forgive you. It is impossible to out the grace of God. So when the enemy tries to get you to believe the lie that God won't forgive us, just remember he's lying. Jesus called him the father of lies. In fact, Jesus said when the devil lies, he's speaking his native language. Okay? He's a liar. Don't believe him. This brings us to verses 8 and 10. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word has no place in our lives. Now, these verses are pretty straightforward. Anyone who claims that they have not sinned is wrong. In fact, verse 10, it, that's kind of scary. You claim to not have sinned, you're calling God a liar. Mm-mm. -mm. Not me. <laughs> I'm not going to call God a liar. No. We all know that everyone has sin in their life. I don't have to tell anybody that they're a sinner. You know. I don't believe that there's anybody here that would say they have no sin in their life. That would be ludicrous. We all struggle. We all have sin. This is why it's so important to not judge others for their sin. But you know, it's so easy to judge somebody for something I don't struggle with. You ever notice that? So easy to judge somebody else for a sin that I don't struggle with. Oh, there's sins I definitely do struggle with, but there are sins I don't. You could put a bottle of beer or a joint in front of me. I don't care. No temptation whatsoever. Why? Because I'm, I'm not tempted with that stuff. I do know people, though, where if that was sitting in front of them, it would be a completely different story. It's so easy to judge them, isn't it? Why don't you just stop? Now, if, you're, if you've never struggled with addiction, you, you don't understand the mind of an addict. Telling an addict to just stop would be like me telling you to just stop breathing. Okay? Oh, but it's so easy to judge if you don't struggle with it. But if somebody struggles in the same area that I do, you ever notice it's a lot easier to, to show grace? A whole lot easier to show grace. We need to remember that sin is normal. I'm not saying sin's okay. It's not. But I am saying it's normal. It's not okay. There's not an excuse. But we all sin. We all sin. The problem is, though, that many within the church do not want to admit their sin. We have a casual greeting here in the United States that uh, you don't really see in a lot of other countries. You know, if you run into somebody, what's the first thing you do? I run into Joe on the street and say, hey, Joe, how you doing? Do I really want to know how Joe's doing? Not always. <laughs> I mean, I love Joe. Joe's my brother. Joe's having an issue. I hope he would come to me and talk with me. I know I could go to him and talk to him about anything I'm struggling with. Why? He's my brother in Christ. I trust him. But sometimes I'm kind of in a hurry. I got something I got to do. But I'll still say, hey, Joe, how you doing? Well, you know, now that you mentioned, I'm kind of like, oh, yeah, that's great. God bless you. See ya. But that's not typically the standard answer. When somebody says, hey, how you doing? I'm fine. I'm doing great. Or the Christian answer, I'm blessed. But you know, I'm not always great. I'm not always fine. 
I don't always feel blessed. Sometimes life really stinks. But yet I've been chastised by very well-meaning believers who say, oh, don't claim that for your life. Don't speak that over your life. Oh, so like you're saying that God is sitting up in heaven saying, you know, Harry, I was going to help you, but you just said that your life stinks and those weren't the right words and so I'm not going to help you now. No, he's not going to do that. Why? He's, a, he's my loving heavenly father. A loving father wouldn't do that to their child. Not at all. And you know, I've discovered that the church, by and large, is one of the most unsafe places in the world to be honest and vulnerable. It should be the safest place. But all too often, it's not. This should be a safe place for somebody to stand up and say, you know, I've been hiding an addiction for years, and I need help. You know, I had an affair on my spouse recently. I go places online that I've got no business being. I steal from my workplace. I'm lazy. I waste time. I struggle with doubt. I'm not sure God's even real. What better place to come for help than the church? But yet, I don't feel safe most of the time. I don't. Biggest betrayals I have ever experienced have been from people who claim to love Jesus. A couple of you here know my story. Some of you, most of you don't. I'm in the process of putting my story on video so I can get it on YouTube because I, I think the details could help some people. But to just sum it up, I went through about a 10-year journey in which my faith was almost entirely deconstructed. I was this close to being an agnostic all the while being a preacher, standing up in the pulpit on Sunday mornings preaching sermons that I didn't believe or I wasn't sure about, but I preached them because it was what I was taught. And one day, I really needed to talk to somebody, and I talked with a retired pastor who was part of my denomination who I thought I could trust, and two days later, I get a phone call from my district superintendent. Guess what I never did again? We need to be a safe place. If you're struggling with sin, one of the best things you can do is take it out of the darkness into the light. Get it out of the darkness and into the light. Perfect example. Yeah, and I'm not ashamed to admit, I'm ashamed it happened. I'm not ashamed to admit it because God has delivered me. But I, I suffered from a full-blown porn addiction for many years in my life. And, uh, you know, overcame it, you know, through, you know through, through Christ, through the support of, of friends, through the support of my wife. And there was one night, it was a Saturday night while I was pastoring. I was sitting in my office finishing up my sermon and I had this overwhelming urge to go somewhere online that I had no business going. I mean, it was like overwhelming. So what did I do? I called my wife. I took that temptation out of the darkness and I put it into, my, into the light and I said, honey, I'm really struggling right now. I've got this huge temptation to go to an adult site. Why did I tell her? Because she's my number one supporter. I know a lot of guys who couldn't tell their wife that. And if you can't tell your wife that, find a friend you can. But I can tell her. And I also know, I also knew as soon as I got home, she was going to ask me, okay, did you behave yourself? I can't lie to her. <laughs> I've tried. It doesn't work. <laughs> you know? I, seriously, I cannot lie. I, I stink at lying to my wife. I know that I would have to be honest with her. And the fact that I took it out of the darkness into the light, guess where I didn't go that night? I didn't go that place I shouldn't have gone. This needs to be a safe place to take things out of the darkness into the light. 
Now, I'm not saying that if somebody's committed a crime that you shouldn't report it. I'm not saying certain crimes should be reported. If I stand up here and confess that I killed three people last night, you should call the police. Yes, you can still help me find repentance and work through that, yes, but I still need to face the consequences for that action, okay? We all struggle. We all have issues. And the sooner we're honest about it, the faster that the kingdom of God will grow. People need to know that this church is a safe place to be vulnerable. Whether it is or not is up to you. Be that trustworthy person, that confidant. Don't gossip about it. And that includes prayer requests. Includes prayer requests. Because sometimes in church, oh man, we have any prayer requests this morning? Oh, yeah, I've got this prayer request. I mean, uh, wow, Dave Johnson, the other day we were talking, and uh, he told me about this issue and that issue, and this, and this. I give all the tea, spill it all right there. Oh, I just want you to pray for Dave. Well, no, I don't have to give all that detail. I don't even have to give a name, you know? I was talking with somebody the other day that was experiencing this issue. God knows who it is. I don't have to give the details. Now, if Dave wants to stand up and share the details, that's up to him inappropriate for me to share them. I want to be in a place where it's okay to be brutally honest and not be afraid of being judged, condemned, or ostracized. And I especially desire to see this among my fellow pastors. So many times people put us up on a pedestal, expect us to have it all together. No, we don't. We're just normal people like you with a special calling. The only real difference between me and you is that I'm going to be judged more harshly. That's the big difference. I say this phrase quite frequently, and I can't necessarily speak for Pastor Randy, but I know Pastor Randy well enough to to know that he would probably say it as well. I'm just a messed up dude trying to help messed up people follow Jesus. My struggles are the same as yours. Give your pastor grace. I know you do, but give him grace. So as I wrap things up today, bringing things to a close, I want you to remember these four things. Okay, four things I want you to remember. Number one, light causes growth, health, and illuminates the darkness. As those who walk in the light, we should be experiencing this. We should be willing to grow and must be willing to see. And as those who walk in the light, we should also be spreading this as well. We should be spreading this as well. Second thing, to walk in the light, we must follow the teachings that Jesus laid down in the Gospels. To follow those teachings, we need to know those teachings. Number three, we cannot out the grace of God. Impossible. You cannot out the grace of God. I don't care what the enemy is telling you, God is ready and willing and anxious to forgive you of anything. And finally, be honest and open about our shortcomings. Be honest and open about our shortcomings. Because when we do, this allows others to do the same. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity to be here. And Lord, I just ask that um, everybody that leaves uh, would be sensitive to your voice, Lord. I pray that if there's anybody that crosses their path that they can show your love to, that you would help them to, uh, to realize that. If there's anything that needs to change in their lives, that you would speak to them in ways that they would understand. Help us, Lord, to love well, to, to show grace, to show mercy, uh, to give when we should be giving. Um, Lord, I just ask you would continue to lead, guide, and direct us. I pray for Mountaintop Church, Lord. I pray that you would continue to grow this place, that this truly would be a light shining on a hill in this region, that uh, many, 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 many lives would be touched for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.